An underwater welder is the second highest paying welding job in the world. The first is an oil rig welder. But an underwater welder gets paid as much as they do because of the circumstances within which they work. Not only do they have to be certified welders, but they also have to be certified technical divers. They have to be able to go down into the depths of the ocean and ply the dangerous craft of welding down there. That means that they expose themselves to an electric current underwater. Taking fire underwater is an exceptionally difficult and hazardous task. But that's how a lot of our tools work up here on the surface world. If you're building an underwater civilization, what do you do without fire? How does your civilization get going? And what tools will they make? Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Today, I want to talk to you about underwater civilizations their tools and their houses. If you like this kind of topic and if you want to support me in making more of these videos, you can hit my Ko-fi page down below. I have memberships and one-off donations possible, as well as some purchase items in the store. You can also buy my book, available on Amazon.com, or buy my second book via Indiegogo. Okay, enough of that. Let's get cracking. Civilization is actually reasonably young in terms of the age of the human species. Our civilization, as we understand the word to be, really started with the agricultural revolution. But we were making tools a long time before that. And most of those tools, while they may have had some fire to assist, could also be made completely without fire. I am talking, of course, about Stone Age tools. Stone Age tools were predominantly constructed from flint and probably tied onto a handle using string that was spun from various materials available in the natural world. I did do a video on spinning, which you can check out in the information card if you're interested in the history of spinning and how you can apply it to your fantasy world. You could have flint-based tools, even underwater, but it does bring up the question of where does this flint come from? So flint is formed when sea sponges and other heavy silica-based life forms fall into burrows and they fill those burrows up. Then when you have tectonic shifts or climate change and the sea level descends, that silica dries out and it becomes the quartz crystals that form the flint that our ancestors used to make stone tools. So you could theoretically have flint under the ocean if you've had occasions where you had the sea levels change and then change back with rising sea levels once again co covering areas of flint. But in my opinion that fails to take advantage of the underwater world. It fails to make your underwater civilization as rich as it can be. So let's take a look at some alternatives to flint. First there is the very obvious coral. Coral is the skeletons, if you will, of small marine animals that form these coral reefs and then die, leaving behind the coral structures. There are many species of corals, but there are two types for the purpose of our discussion today. Hard corals and soft corals. Hard corals are exactly what they sound like. They are calcium carbonite skeletons left behind by the coral polyps. They are also normally six fractal polyps. Soft corals, on the other hand, are, are a jelly-like substance covering sclerites that hold the polyps together. And they are eight-fold symmetry. The reason why I bring up the six-fold versus eight-fold symmetry is because if you have an underwater civilization, you're going to want numbers that are important to that civilization, right? As we discussed in the video about numbers and cultures. If you're using coral, it is a very nice tie-back to have six or eight 
as important numbers within your undersea civilization. Maybe you could have a pantheon of six gods, or maybe you could have time measured in units of eight to reference the symmetry of the primary building material of the civilization. But let's return to corals and tools. Now, coral is naturally very sharp. Any diver who has had to hung, hang on to coral in strong currents or who has brushed up against coral will tell you that it is in fact quite a sh sharp substance, especially hard coral. So you could quite easily flake coral into knives and into scrapers and into spear points and arrow points, although how you're going to launch it underwater will require a video on weapons underwater, which I'll tackle if you want me to, let me know in the comments below. So with coral, you already have the starting point of your tool. You have the blade part, the sharp part sorted out. And that includes making things like needles, right? Because even a needle point you could make out of the tip of coral that sticks out. I was made aware of another cute thing about corals by Moiria Lord, who left a comment on my video on undersea civilizations. They pointed out that corals are effectively the corpses of dead creatures, right? So if you have necromancy in your undersea civilization, that means that a necromancer who can manipulate the dead could shape coral into anything that their society needed. They could literally take that coral and make it into houses, into weapons, into tools into anything you would need through the art of necromancy, which I think would make a strong argument for why necromancy in an undersea civilization could be a very acceptable, in fact, a lauded and required source of magic. And I think that would be a very interesting path to explore if you're looking to build an undersea civilization. But enough of coral, it's not the only substance under the sea. Let's talk a little bit about shells. There are a vast number of creatures that produce shells as part of their inhabitation below the sea. And those shells can also form the basis for your tools. They can also be flaked into sharp points for spears or into jagged edges for knives or into whatever you need them to be for the tool that you're making. And many of those creatures that have shells also produce pearls. And pearls, of course, form a spherical ball, which can also be very useful in tool making. You can also use the bones of fish or sea mammals. But I think that the bones of fish or sea mammals are better applied as the handle part of the tool. Bearing in mind that an axe, for example, isn't that useful if it doesn't have a handle? A handle makes a dramatic difference to an axe. Now, to attach an axe handle in the world above the sea is quite easy. You find yourself a tree, you get yourself a branch, and you use some rawhide and lash the handle to the axe. But under the sea, wood doesn't do so well. So what do you use instead? And this is where I think bone really comes into its own. I think that here you could use whale bone or any other sea mammal. Even some fishes have got some kind of skeleton. But I think here you're looking more at the mammalians because they tend to have the more robust bones. However, there is also the option of using ivory. The narwhal has a long ivory tusk and walrus have got two ivory tusks. And I think those would also be exceptional handles. You could also look to using the bills of bullfish, fish like the marlin and the sawfish and the swordfish. Now, those fish have these large protuberant bills that stick out like this, and they are very sharp. So you could actually use them as a weapon almost as is. However, catching those kinds of fish is a non-trivial task. I've logged 190 odd dives and I've seen one marlin in my whole life on scuba. 
I mean, I've seen almost every other kind of marine animal you could name, and I have literally only ever seen one marlin. They are very fast. So those are things that you could use as your handle, your ivory, your bones, and things like bills and so on from your fish. But if you're going to have a handle, that means you need to attach it to your tool. Now, what are you going to use for that attachment? So in our world, we used leather quite a lot. And we also used string, which you can make by winding things like cotton together or the fur from sheep or a horse's tail, you know, items like that, animal products like that, which you can wind together in string, which was the precursor of spinning thread, which you could then use to tie one thing to another. But underwater, leather's not going to last long, even if you can make it from skinning animals. And you don't have things that have fur, so you're not going to be using that to make string. So what are you going to make string from? Well, I did speak previously about using whale baleen, and you can check that out in my seafaring video and in my spinning video where I referenced using that substance, which is an extremely versatile and very strong substance. But there are other options. Under the ocean, you do have seagrass, and you can use seagrass plaited together to form string. You could also use kelp plaited together to form string. But what I found really interesting is that you have access to silk under the water. There are a few creatures under the water that secrete silk. The noble pen shell or fan muscle attaches itself to the rocks using silk, like real honest silk, the way a silkworm would secrete. So you could harvest the silk from these muscles. You could even cultivate these muscles, domesticate them, and use that silk as a means of making string. That string making can eventually become spinning, and that spinning can become weaving, which can become clothing. Interestingly, I think that you could automate spinning underwater much faster than we did on the surface of the water because you have access to the currents as a reliable power source. So I think that you could set up automated spindles inside currents to create reams and reams of spun silk from these muscles. Now, these muscles aren't your only silk producers underwater either. There's a crustacean, name on the whiteboard, that also produces silk. And what it does is it takes silk and it actually plaits it into kelp. It actually takes kelp leaves and makes a nest for itself using silk and kelp leaves, which is such a fascinating thing to me. And this Kelp, this kelp nest actually grows with the little creature because, of course, the silk is stretchy and the kelp is still alive. And that is also very interesting. And lastly, carp, the carp fish, attaches its eggs using fibronian, which is a core component of silk. So you do have options under the sea for making string from animal products. And that string can eventually become thread, which can eventually be woven into cloth, which gives you a very strong motivation for making some or all of these animals domesticated animals under the sea. And those are the three things that you need for your basic tools. For your sharp part, you can use shells or coral. For your handle, you can use bone or ivory. And for your string, you can use seagrass, baleen, whale or silk. If you like this discussion of tools and how you can make them underwater, give this video a thumbs up and let's talk about how to build a home. Now, typically when we talk about a civilization, we mean somebody who lives in a city or who builds cities. That does mean that your underwater civilization needs to be capable of at least building some kind of structure in order to be considered a civilization by your readers. Our first cities were built around agriculture. They were built in locations where the farmland was particularly rich. 
And in your undersea civilization, the cities are likely to be built on the same kinds of principles. They're likely to be built in rich areas. But what does rich mean under the water? It means places where there's a fair chunk of current. Current brings upwelling from the bottom, which brings nutrient-rich water up with it, which of course attracts life, corals, fish, everything that you need for a civilization. So your city is likely to be built in places of fairly strong current, probably from multiple different oceans, because that's your richest area in the, in the ocean. If you look at the Coral Triangle, where the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans meet, you can see that this is very valid in our world, for example. But current means that your houses need to be able to withstand the constant battering of that current, as well as the surge from waves above. So you're probably not looking at completely sealed houses. You're looking at houses that ha will allow some of the current to flow through it, while remaining anchored in place. The other important thing to think about when you're designing your houses is that you're not so much looking for shelter from the weather. What you're looking for is a safe place from predators and a place to store stuff that other things can't get into. So the houses will probably be reasonably small, at least to start with. I think that it might also be worth looking at whether your cities will be built close to active volcanoes. Unlike in the land civilizations where an active volcano represents a real hazard to a burgeoning town, under water an active volcano produces heat that is critical for life. It produces a lot of nutrients because the warmer water attracts fish life. There's often a lot of through flow of water and currents and movement. So a volcano can actually offer you a lot of advantages as a civilization. It is also one of the few natural ways to access fire under the water. So you could, in theory, have some form of smithing at an underwater volcano. You could also use the volcano as a chemical mine and use various chemical interactions and processes to replace smithing in your world. So that instead of using fire to build things, you use certain chemical reactions to create brick equivalents and so on. So it's worth thinking about whether at least your initial civilizations would be built close to active volcanoes. The other thing to consider is whether you have a land-based civilization above or perhaps whether you had one in the past and you're looking at a post-apocalyptic civilization. The reason why is because glass makes an amazing home under the sea. And many of the creatures currently residing under the sea really appreciate a glass bottle in the, in the ocean because they can use it to hide in, they can carry it with them if they move, and it makes a very effective home. But creating glass takes a very high degree of control of a fire and a very high temperature. So you're not just going to do that snap of the fingers in an undersea civilization. That means that either your undersea civilization is trading for glass with your above the surface civilization or potentially there was a above the surface civilization but the, something happened this is a post-apocalyptic world and there are these glass artifacts that your undersea civilization now uses as homes and that would also be a really interesting bit of lore building. The ocean has one more unique attribute in terms of building a home that we should talk about, and that is symbiotic homes. So in the ocean, you can see this most clearly with the clownfish, the Nemos, who of course make their home inside anemones, which actually have quite a strong sting, and the clownfish has become immune to the anemone. You can also see it with things like crabs, which occasionally will pick up fire urchins and put them on their shells and carry them around as a means of protection 
as they traverse the ocean floor because the fire urchin is, of course, very, very painful to touch. This kind of symbiotic relationship might not be ideal for creating a home for your intelligent underwater species unless they're a derivative of clownfish and so they live in an anemone, which would be very interesting. But the part that I want to focus on here is the potential for bathhouses. Bet you didn't expect that topic in an undersea civilization. So bathhouses is something that our civilizations have had for a very long time. In fact, the first bathhouse that we had was called the Great Bathhouse, and it was built in the Indus River, which makes it old as dirt. So how do you have a bathhouse in an undersea civilization? Well, the potential's already there in that symbiotic relationship that exists between so many creatures under the sea. Fish underwater, even big fish like the manta ray or shark or whales, pick up parasites under the water. They then go to cleaning stations where cleaning wrasses eat those parasites off them. And if you've ever seen a cleaning station, you will know that it's one of the most amazing experiences under the water because the fish that's being cleaned will open its mouth fully and the cleaning wrasses will swim inside and they will actually eat the parasites off the fish's teeth and off its um, and, and out of its mouth and completely clean it in, inside its mouth as well as along the outside of its body and eat all those parasites away. It is incredible to see. Your undersea civilization could do the same thing. You could have public bathhouses where you have cleaning wrasses that come to the station to clean your people. Those wrasses then become another species for you to add to the domestication list and a place where people can flex. You can talk about having this breeding line of wrasses, these cleaning wrasses that make people clean underwater and all of these kinds of really relatable aspects of status associated with what kind of cleaning wrasse can you afford. And I think that it also makes for a great leisure activity for your underwater civilization. And those are my thoughts on undersea tools and undersea houses and how to build them. Please give this video a thumbs up and maybe check out my video on undersea communication. And I will see you soon for another video from Just In Time Worlds.